Good morning, church. If you'll open your Bibles to Luke chapter 14, I'll join you there shortly. Our culture, our society today, and those who call themselves Christians in it, are infatuated with this idea of Jesus is oftentimes just not so. And I want to point this out. I've talked about before how I studied with a friend of mine, and one of the things he realized very quickly is that Jesus is not this nice guy that everybody says he is. And I was looking through the Gospels, and I was thinking about the message this morning, and a couple of these incidents stood out for me. There came a point where Jesus and his disciples were walking along the road, and a man said to him, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. Isn't this a wonderful sentiment? This is a wonderful thing? Here comes this man, and he says, Jesus, I'll follow you to the ends of the earth. Ah, oh, my heart swells. And then Jesus looks at him and says, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Get out of here, guy. You're not fit. He said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. What happened? I thought Jesus was a nice guy. Hmm. Let's keep looking. There came another point where a rich young ruler came to him and asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus challenges him on the concept of good and that God alone is good. But then he says, you know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal and you shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he proudly declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack. One thing you lack. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. and You will have treasure in heaven then come follow me. Imagine you're given an invitation to follow Jesus. You're given an invitation to follow the creator of the universe who's doing the most important work on the planet. And the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. There was another time when Jesus was teaching in the temple in Jerusalem where he said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as a living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Rather, I apologize, he said this while teaching in the synagogue, not the temple. But on hearing this, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Let me put that into perspective for you. Many of these disciples who followed him followed John first, and they witnessed the baptism of Jesus. They were witnesses of the voice from heaven who proclaimed, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Many of them will go on and be witnesses of his miracles and the feedings of the 5,000. But on hearing this teaching, they break. Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Does this thing that I just said, does this offend you? And what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they're full of the Spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. We need to understand, church, that God wants everyone saved. Scripture is very clear about this. Peter says it, and Paul says it to Timothy. 
It says, God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but all people to come to repentance. But somewhere along the line, Christians got it in their head that the best way to get people to to repent, the best way to get people to follow, the best way to get people to be disciples is to lie to them. Oh, we don't want to say anything about that sin. We don't want to say that. Oh, we don't want to challenge people in their wrong thinking. My favorite is I was, sat in, I was sitting down and studying with someone, and he, was, he is studying with me, and he's studying with some other people. Um, he's studying with some Mormons. And he, looks at, he said, I looked at these Mormons, and I said, look, I'm not saying that you guys are wrong. I'm just saying I believe in the Bible. And I looked at him, and I said, well, I mean, I, I, I'm glad for you. I'm glad I agree with you. I believe in the Bible, too. And they're wrong. And it's okay to say that. It's okay to say that they're wrong. They're heretics, but guys, I mean, look, it's very simple. Paul makes it very clear. If anyone comes to you and preaches a different gospel than the one I proclaimed, they are to be accursed. Oh, preacher, we can't tell people that. God forbid we tell them the truth and they and save their souls. They're to be accursed. Mormonism, false teaching. Jehovah's Witness, false teaching. You want to sit down and you want to talk about why? Let's do it. But we're not doing anybody any good walking around telling them that everything they're hearing is okay. And yet our culture is infatuated with this because the only real sin you can commit in our communities today is to tell someone they're wrong. I just read three different passages where Jesus did just that made a career of doing it. And here we are again. In Luke chapter 14, large crowds were traveling with Jesus. Why? Because he fed them. Because he healed them. Because he cured them. Because he confronted the enemy, the real enemy, who is not people. People who are lost in the darkness are enslaved to sin and the powers of chaos. They're victims. We want to save them. But at some point, the only way to save them is to point out their chains, is to point out the things that enslave them, is to teach them the gospel, to bring the light, and show the truth of the matter. Jesus knows this. And so he looks at those who are following because they've been fed. He looks at those who are following because they've been healed. He looks at those who have been following because they've been saved from the enemy. They've been given freedom. He looks at those who have been following. And he looks at them and he says, notice these are the people who are following Jesus. They're traveling with him. And he says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, Yes, even their own life. Such a person cannot be my disciple. Think about that. If anyone comes to me and does not hate, that word hate doesn't convey the conviction behind that word. If that word is despise. It's a stronger word. I don't know, for me it's stronger, but if they don't despise their own mother and their father, their children, everything, if they don't despise it, they, such a person cannot be my disciple. Jesus has beaten them off with a stick. Think about what this meant in the first century. Today it's commonplace, right? Today it's commonplace for kids to despise their parents. It's almost like, I know for my generation, it's almost like part and parcel. If you're a millennial, you've got to despise your parents. That's like, that's like part of the, the job, right? In our communities today, it's common for kids to grow up and leave their families and leave their parents and and walk away. It's common for kids to grow up and not continue in the profession of their fathers. This is a common thing. In their day and age, it wasn't. Jesus is saying, you have to reject the community. He's saying, if you're not willing to reject your community, those closest to you, Every support system, because that's what this is. Your father and your mother, that's a support system. Your wife and your children, these are your obligations. Your brothers and your sisters, this is expanded support system. Yes, even your very life, you are not fit to be my disciple. When was the last time you heard somebody say that? When was the last time you looked at somebody And your way of enticing them to the gospel, your presentation of the gospel included offending them. 
sister, I know the last time, at least, now I hope it wasn't the last time, but you know, I know, and you know what happened in that room that day, don't we? When we sat down with that lady. She screamed at me for an hour, church. Why? Because I had the audacity to tell her the truth. Homosexuals, those practicing homosexuality, not those struggling in sin, but those willfully practicing and engaging in homosexuality will not inherit the kingdom of God. God forbid I tell that woman the truth. But we've decided that the best way to attract disciples is not to tell them the truth, but entice them with a lollipop. Oh, Jesus is here to make your life better. You should follow Jesus because he's going to make you rich. He's going to make you healthy and happy. He wants all those things for you. The people who preach that have never read the book of Job. Where the enemy walks into the throne room of God and, and God himself says, Have you considered my servant Job? Mm. God himself signs Job up for that suffering. And God himself declares Job was righteous. What are we doing, church? How are we talking to the people around us? Are we confronting them with truth? Or are we telling them what they want to hear? There's a lot of empty seats in this auditorium. Wouldn't it be nice for this place to be filled? I tell you how we do it, church. It's real simple. It's real popular. I tell you what we'll do. We'll put a bar up here on stage. We'll have this place filled in no time. We'll put a bar up here on stage. We'll pull the mo we'll pull the curtain down. We'll show movies. We'll charge admission. Church, we'll make more money. We'll make money hand over fist. How many people what do you think want to come to a church where we can get drunk and watch movies? It'd be blast. It'd be fun. In the summer, we'll set up slip and slides out there. Come on, church. We got a few fill these pews, don't we? It seems to me that Jesus wasn't interested in filling pews, but making disciples. And this is, the cut. this is the crux of it. If you want to be my disciple, if you want to follow Jesus, you've got to despise everything. You go, wait a minute. Preachers, it doesn't make sense. Because God in his law says that we ought to honor our father and our mother. Later on, Paul's going to write a letter to Timothy, and he's going to say quite simply, if anyone, if anyone despises their family, almost like it sounds like it's contradicting what Jesus is saying here, but Paul's going to look at him and says, if anyone despises their family... If anyone does not see to their family's needs, they have denied the faith and are worse than an unbeliever. So is Jesus saying that we ought to, I don't understand, what is he, are we, do we hate our families or do we care for our families? What are we supposed to do? If your family comes between you and God, a disciple picks God. The same gentleman I was studying with was telling me about all the horrible things that was going, were going on in his family and how he struggles because he wants to honor his father, but his father has done horrible things. And he goes, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, so I've, I've cut my father off from my children because I want to protect them. I want to protect the family, but I want to honor him at the same time. And I said, the way you honor your father is you tell him the truth. You tell him the truth. Father, I love you. I don't want anything bad to happen to you. And if you continue to go down the road you're going down, you're going to end up in destruct destruction because you will reap what you sow. Our God will not be mocked. And I'm telling you this not because I hate you, not because I want to condemn you, but because I want you to be saved. When we sat in that room and I told that woman what I told her, I didn't tell her because I wanted to make a fool out of her. I didn't tell her because I hated her. I told her because I saw me. I saw where I was before the gospel. Lost, twisted up, and confused. And I know the only thing that made a difference in my life was when someone was bold enough to tell me the truth. Church, we ought to be a people who tell people the truth. We ought to be a people bold enough to love people truly as God loves them and tell them the truth. Jesus did that. If anyone comes to me and does not hate their father and their mother, their wife and their children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. But it's much worse than that. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. You know, in the 21st century, crosses are a thing of beauty. It's interesting because in the first century, they were a torture device. It was the most abhorrent way 
for a person to be put to death. It was so bad that Justin Martyr, one of the first apologists, had to, part of his apologist, an apologist is someone who speaks away charges against Christianity, had to speak a defense of Jesus dying on the cross, of God submitting himself to die a death on the cross. You see, the Romans and the Greeks in their myths had plenty of stories about God's dying. Their problem was not that a God died. Their problem was that one would submit to the shame of the cross. Because only the worst offenders, only the worst criminals, only blasphemers and revilers died on a cross. In fact, it was so bad that it was illegal for Roman citizens to be put to death via the cross. This is why Paul was beheaded by Nero rather than crucified. Because it would have been illegal for Nero to have him crucified. Jesus looks at his disciples. He looks at these men who are following him. These men, these women, these families that are following him. And he tells them the truth. You've got to love God. You've got to serve God. He's got to become the priority in your life, even more so than your own. But it gets much worse because if you're not willing to pick up that torture device, if you're not willing to put yourself on it, you are not worthy of being my disciple. If you're not willing to die the death of a criminal, You can have no part of me. Jesus' expectation, church, is that we surrender to one another. And it's true. It's true. And anyone who's been around a church long enough knows that sometimes you're going to have to eat humble pie. It was funny. Mark and I were coming out of the jail. We were coming out of the jail uh, on Friday morning. And we both got a letter from a ministry, from a prison ministry, asking us to follow up with an individual. And all it had in this letter was their address out in Yoakum. Now I'm a millennial church. If you've given me somebody's address, is worthless, okay? I ain't going over to somebody's house. I'm calling them on the phone. That's what any normal, sane person does. Who just goes over to somebody's house unannounced? You're likely to get shot. In this day and age, who does that? So we come walking out of the prison, and I go, would you want to... I'm looking at Mark, I go, you want to go over there? And he goes, well, all we have is the address. And I said, I know. You know, what are the chances that we're going to catch this guy, really? (sighs) Well, we're already here in Cuero. We might as well go. Thank God we did. Thank God that he is so good that he can take a grumbling, complaining, worthless servant like me and use me for his glory. We went and we found him. And he was there. I was shocked when he answered the door. And he's in desperate need of prayer, in desperate need of encouragement, in desperate need of a church. What I mean is a body of believers that can surround him with the love of Christ. He needed that. It was painted on his face. And if it had been up to me, we would have gone home. I'm a failure. But God is awesome. And he can take failures and he can make them very good. But the first thing that you have to do is give up everything. You have to be willing to say. You have to be willing to be a fool. You have to be willing to die. You have to be willing to give him everything. And even when you don't want to do it, you do it. Because he owns us. Because it's no longer about me and what I want, but about him and what he wants. That struggle is very real. If you want to be my disciple, you have to despise everything. You have to deny yourself. And you have to follow. And then he says at the end of this passage, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. He talks, he tells two stories here. I'm not going to tell them, but he, he tells two stories about counting the cost. And that's legitimate, church. When we're talking to people in the world, We have to understand that part of the conversation has to be, you're going to have to give up everything. Being a Christian is the most difficult thing you will ever do in this life. It is not for suckers. It is not easy. It is not simple. 
Because every day you're going to have to stand up, wake up, look at yourself in the mirror and say, everything I want to do, everything I've been trained to do, everything I've been raised to do, I've got to say no to. And instead I've got to make that decision to pick up my cross and follow Jesus. Instead I've got to make that decision to give up everything to follow Jesus. In a world consumed with its own pleasures, the most difficult thing one can do is deny himself. But that is the exact standard, the expectation, brass tacks, the requirement for being our Lord's disciple. Church, this morning, I don't know where everyone in this room is at, but I imagine there are some of you out there like me who struggle to humble themselves, to yield themselves, to submit themselves under the hand of God. And what I want you to know this morning, if you're out there and you're struggling, that's good. It's really those who don't struggle that ought to be concerned. So if you're out there this morning and you're struggling, or if you're out there this morning and you're not sure of where you stand with Jesus, of your relationship with Him, of your place before the throne, if you're not sure, you can't say with the utmost confidence this morning that you are His disciple and you want to learn more. You've been challenged this morning to give up everything and follow. I want to encourage you. I've got elders standing up in the back of the room. I'm going to be right back there in the prayer room. If you need to come this morning, I ask that you come as we stand.